Being a marketer is no sweat. You just have to manage dozens of channels, launch hundreds of campaigns, score thousands of leads, and... Okay, fine. It's a lot of sweat. Unless you have HubSpot's AI-powered marketing tools to help you do all that and more. Get started at HubSpot.com slash marketers. So I was watching, I mean, you were on Levitard Live this morning, Mm -hmm. talking college football, talking NFL. Mm -hmm. Someone in the chat goes, hey, isn't it opening night in the NBA? Opening night. It's opening night. It's opening night. By the time you guys listen to this, opening night already happened. And boy, what an opening night it was. I mean, wow. can you believe? Oh, my God. Mind blown. Mind blown. First of all, Joe Mazzula. Who knew, right? Yeah. Wow. It's going to be a hell of a year with him at the helm based on his coaching decisions. Certainly different. Different coaching style. Yes, not the same. Not the same. Not the same. James Harden, he certainly lost weight. Wow. I can say that unequivocally. It's cool to see that. And then that late game. Oh, my God. Draymond getting his ring. <laughs> oh, my God. What an event that was. And it's just great to see, you know, the Warriors getting the rings. And, hey, I thought it was a really special moment to see Juan Toscano Anderson getting the ring yeah. with the Warriors. That was a tearjerker. He's a local kid. He grew up in the Bay Area, you know. And now, obviously, he's made the transition to the Lakers. It's funny. I think I could do this entire podcast bullshitting about something that I haven't seen because it hasn't happened yet, but pretending like I have. Mm. This is what it feels like to be Stugatz. (laughs) Like Russell Westbrook fitting in so well with the Lakers and how everything's going so great in that first game. It was seamless. Their offense looks amazing. I mean, I was like, which one of the Warriors? Am I right? Because you know, I mean, you can edit any video to make it look any way. Yeah. You can cut any video and make anything you want out of it. It's not up to me to be able to judge that. We can have highlights right now Mm -hmm. of Russell Westbrook looking amazing on the Lakers, Mm -hmm. but that's not what big media wants you to see. They're going to show you all the clips of him looking bad. Yep. We're going to show all his turnovers and all the missed shots and say, oh, it's Russell Westbrook's fault. He's not good anymore. Don't fall for it. Don't fall for their shenanigans. Yeah, don't fall for the fact that he shot, what, 30% in the preseason and he's not efficient anymore. Tom sounds like big media. Yeah, I don't like this. Okay, maybe I'll do it this way. Mace, how about we do two versions of this intro and then depending on what happens oh. in the opening night, you can cut it up oh. and present it however you want it to be. So, Love it. wow, Steph Curry, what a game winner. Just what a shot. Russell Westbrook was benched down the stretch. It was just ugly, man. The Lakers be lakering. Okay, give me that other take, Tom. (laughs) All right. Wow, Russell Westbrook. Can you believe it? 40-point triple-double. That's what the media doesn't want you to see. They almost tried to take down the broadcast. You saw that during the middle of the fourth quarter when Russ was going off. Why not? Well, you know what? They don't want you to see Russ going off. They shut off the broadcast. Is that too specific there, Mace? I mean, what are the chances that that happened? Welcome to the first Choose Your Own Adventure episode of Basketball Illuminati. (laughs) My assignment. Uncover why the association inspires more conspiracy theories in volume and salience than any other U.S. sport. You've heard of the Illuminati. The truth is out there, but so are lies. Your eyes can deceive you. Don't trust them. The NBA has always been controlled by about eight people. Denial is the most predictable of all human responses. If you're only using 10% of your brain, you don't even know that you're using 10% of your brain. The NBA Illuminati. If coincidences are just coincidences, why do they feel so contrived? The Illuminati. But you start to follow the money, and you don't know where the f*** is going to take you. It is unspoken. They have influence among other players. The NBA Illuminati. I don't have time for your convenient ignorance. Maybe I'm a conspiracist now as well. That's but- all it took. Oh, we got books, we got schools. You saw a video on YouTube. <laughs> Why am I, sir? You've never used them before. We are the basketball Illuminati. <laughs> This 
This is Basketball Illuminati. I am Tom Haberstroh, and as always, I am joined by my five-star Illumin Army generals, Amin Al Hassan, coming to you live from Miami, and producer Anthony Mays coming from the Bay Area. Mays, you are excited about the Warriors season. Everything is coming together. We've got extensions for some players, mm. non-extensions for others. There were punches mm. thrown. We don't need to talk about all that. Mm -mm. We're going to talk about a crazy story coming out of Knickerbocker land where a lawyer was banned from going to Knicks games because he was involved in litigation against Madison Square Garden. Say what it is, because he was doing his job. Doing his job. He's doing his job as a lawyer. This does seem like a scene out of Succession on HBO, but it's in real life that not only is this guy getting banned from going to Madison Square Gardens, even though he's a season ticket holder since the 70s, but his entire law firm is also banned from going any of the MSG properties around New York City. We're going to talk to Ian Begley of SNY, longtime beat writer for the New York Knicks to unpack that entire situation but you know what time it is it's extension season time let's get to it you are listening to the agenda with tom haverstrow and amin el hassan get your checkbooks out check that bank account it's payday baby Payday across the NBA, not any sort of blockbuster trades at the 11th hour like we saw with James Harden several years ago. 10 years ago. That was 10 years ago. Oh, man. Can you believe that? The first thing I ever wrote about for ESPN was deconstructing the Harden trade. Oh, was it? What Oklahoma City got in return. Okay, I'm now looking this up. It was an insider, so I don't know. Do they still have those? Are those still up? I'm getting a lot of... Secondary hits here, like yeah. NBA Insider says, Rockets will trade James Harden. You were right about that. Yeah. Harden's skill set, perfect for D'Antoni's system. Amin El Hassan from 2016. Okay, several players got extensions. Kevin Porter has a very interesting one. We also saw extensions for Brandon Clark in Memphis. DeAndre Hunter re-upped with the Hawks. And don't forget about Nasir Little with the Trailblazers. And you might be saying, who cares? They're staying with their teams. Why do we care about it? Well, there's a lot of reasons to care about extensions, one of which is how they're reported to the media. Mm-hmm. That's right, boys and girls, because what you hear, what you read, I should say, isn't necessarily the reality of what's actually happening. What do I mean by that? Well, because NBA contracts more and more frequently have incentives in them, the number being reported varies by the reporter. I don't know if you guys noticed this. Some reporters report the bigger number. Some reporters report the smaller number. And we're here to tell you, give you a handy-dandy third-eye guide mm -hmm. how to suss out who's the source for the reporter. Now, Amin, let's get some actual tangible examples here. Jordan Poole, pool party broke out on Saturday morning at 1147. ESPN's Adrian Wojnarowski reporting. Golden State Warriors guard Jordan Poole is finalizing a four-year, $140 million contract extension. His agents Drew Morrison and Austin Brown of CAA Sports tell ESPN. Sides are completing final details today and a formal agreement expected soon. Okay, $140 million for Jordan Poole. That's a lot of money, I mean. You're damn right it's a lot of money, but... At the same time, we got a completely different number from Anthony Slater. What? Who reported that the deal was worth $123 million. So, Tom, how could it be possible for two respected, reputable reporters to have this deal be so different? Well... Anthony Slater from The Athletic coming in with these numbers, $123 million over the course of the four-year deal. It can stretch to $140 million, mm. as he says, but the odds of Poole obtaining every dollar of that extra $17 million are near impossible given the incentive structure in place. And after I read these details mm -hmm. from Anthony Slater of The Athletic, great reporter, if you haven't subscribed to The Athletic, man... He alone is worth that subscription. I mean, I read wow. these details and I will tell you. Send that to Zach. 
<laughs> After you subscribe for Zach Harper, you can get your information from Anthony Slater and you can go over to Zach Harper's power rankings and critique all of his positions. Why are the Celtics an eighth? That's crap. Go on and on. But yes, Anthony Slater. What did he say? Anthony Slater coming in with the details. And after reading him, I mean, I promise you that that Mm -hmm. Adrian Wojnarowski tweet reported number of $140 million. That ain't happening. Mm -hmm. There is zero chance. Give me some details here. Hit me with some details because I don't know these. Who will make an extra $250,000 if he plays at least 65 regular season games and the Warriors reach the first round of the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Who will make an extra $250,000 if he plays at least 65 regular season games and the Warriors reach the second round of the playoffs and so on and so forth. He will also make an extra $250,000 if he plays at least 65 games in the regular season and the Warriors win at least 52 regular season games. Now the NBA as Slater notes has deemed all of those five, basically if they make the playoffs and go past the first round, second round conference finals and reach the NBA finals and also win 52 games. Those are called likely incentives. Now the NBA has these legalese points, Mm -hmm. likely incentives, likely bonuses versus unlikely bonuses and unlikely incentives. Right. So Jordan Poole has a base salary of 123 million and about $1.3 million in likely bonuses. Why do fans care about that? Here's the deal. So Jordan Poole has a number that's going to appear on the Warriors cap sheet starting next year. But because those bonuses are in there, are we going to go with the lower salary or the higher salary? Is it going to be the starting salary based on $123 million or the starting salary based on $140 million? And the way the league has decided to accurately depict this is by deeming bonuses to be either likely or unlikely. And that's not the league saying, yeah, I bet you he's going to do it or not. Likely is very simple. Did you do it last year? Then yes, it's going to be a likely bonus. So for instance, Played 65 games and the team wins 52 wins. He did that last year. So the league says that one, that 250K right there, that is a likely bonus. So add it 0.25 million to however many millions he's got. Versus if one of the incentives were something like he's got to start in 65 games, then that's an unlikely bonus. Not because we don't think it's going to happen. Could happen, right? If Steph gets hurt or someone like that, he'd be the de facto starter. But the idea is that He didn't do that last year. Right. So it automatically becomes unlikely. So when these are likely bonuses, those likely bonuses count against the cap. Yes. But the unlikely bonuses do not. And by the way, if he ends up not meeting the criteria for the bonus by the end of the year, the year end calculation then takes off all of that stuff. So he might carry an extra 0.25 million on his cap hit for the entire season. They end up winning 47 games. At the end of the year, they don't have to pay him that extra money, and the end of the year calculation will reflect a 0.25 discount there. And that will be very important on the Warriors' tax bill, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Absolutely. The reason I was very strong about him not getting to $140 million over the next four years is because of this part. Yeah, what are the unlikely incentives, Tom? Jordan Poole will make an extra $1 million payout if he wins MVP. There you go. Mm. There it is. Who will make an extra $1 million if he wins defensive player of the year? Oh my gosh. Which I think is less likely. (laughs) She get a $2 million bonus there. Poole will make an extra $500,000 if he makes any of the three all NBA teams. And Poole will make an extra 500 K if he makes any of the all defensive teams. So again, now I want you to count double. (laughs) Yeah. In order for Jordan Poole To reach that reported $140 million, here's what needs to happen. He'll have to play at least 65 games in all four seasons. The Warriors will have to go at least 52 and 30 in each of the four seasons and reach the finals in all four seasons. On top of that, he would have to earn four straight all NBA squads, four straight all defensive teams, four straight MVPs, and as you said it, the most unlikely of them all, four straight deep boys. <laughs> oh, my God. And if he checks all those boxes, they got a bargain. Yeah, it's true. Look, for the average fan out there, who cares? 123, 140. It's not my money. As long as he's with the team, that's all I care about. 
here is where we peel back the curtain a little bit to explain the dynamics here at play. I am going to reread the tweet, the breaking news tweet, and the Illuminarmy soldiers out there are already opening their third eye at this point in this segment because there was a very interesting detail in that reported news, the scoop at 11.47 on Saturday morning. Golden State Warriors guard Jordan Poole is finalizing a four-year, $140 million contract extension. His agents, Drew Morrison and Austin Brown of CAA Sports, tell ESPN. Sides are completing final details today and formal agreement expected soon. Now, which part of that statement should you have your third eye wide open to? Oh, man, we try to teach you guys over and over, man. Those three little letters dictate how you are getting your news. There is no rational human being, not even Jordan Poole, who thinks that he's going to get $140 million or $139 million or $138 million or $130 million. If you're talking about $3 million in the most unlikely of incentives per year, MVP, Depoy, all NBA, all defense. That's $3 million right there. Multiply that about four years. That's $12 million of funny money. In the contract. So who would be compelled to report the news to you to include that funny money? It would be someone who benefits from having a bigger number out there. Hmm. Jordan Poole knows. He looks at this and he's like, there's no way I'm winning Depoy let alone depoy four years in a row. So who benefits from having the funny money reported? Those three letters, CAA. There you go. The agent wants to sound like, look at me. I got Jordan freaking pool, $140 million. Tyler here only got 130. Only got 130, you oh, bum. <laughs> I got 140 right here. And when you go to the news story at ESPN, does it mention that at all? Does not mention that, but here's the part where it gets even more interesting. Why would Adrian Wojnarowski report an inflated number? I love having breaking news delivered to me and then having to look for a secondary source to get the real number. It's not <laughs> accurate in terms of realistically what he's going to do. And it's not like it's going to get him that money. So Jordan Poole really doesn't care one way or another. So we've established the only people or entity that benefits from this is the agency, which is CAA which is the agency that reps Adrian Wojnarowski. And this is what we're talking about with Illuminati, is trying to de-blur the lines that connect different things. You as a, I'm a big basketball fan, I follow everybody, I got the Woj bomb, but you don't know what you're being fed is adulterated. Maze has his third eye wide open. You see this tweet, you're like, okay, let me go find the next tweet that's going to explain everything to me. Because I know the information here is tainted. But think of all the other people walking around with just two eyes open. Oh, it's heartbreaking. It is. I got to ask you, I mean, the graphic, he's made some modifications. The headshot's gone. And I know your favorite part, the ticker at the bottom. They took it away? Breaking news, breaking news, breaking news, breaking news? It's gone. Oh. No. We're down to just one breaking news per graphic. No, come on. This is sad. So they took away his face and the breaking news ticker? Well, damn, it's just a tweet at that point. Yeah. <laughs> when we talk about reported figures, this matters not just from seeing how the reporting game manifests itself in the news, where 140, by Woj tweeting that out, people aren't going to say 123. No. Because Woj gets it out there at 140, and then you go, oh, my God, Jory Poole got 140. And then you at the cocktail party have to be like, uh, it's actually 123. By getting the 140 out there, it is doing a lot of water carrying for that agency. And I get it. That's a big number. Hey. <laughs> I'm Tom Haverstrow, and you're watching The Big Number. Yeah, this has got to be a real crisis of identity for you, Tom, because you love big numbers, but now your third eye is wide open. Yeah, a slightly smaller big number is not as catchy no. of a brand name, but maybe I have to go with that now. Obviously, there is a very clear line between Adrian and the agency that reps him and also reps Jordan Poole. But I don't want people to get confused and think that that's the exclusive domain of that type of relationship. The reality is anytime a reporter's source is an agent, that number is going to be the biggest possible number. And so what I'm trying to do is give everyone who's a listener this tool of when you see a tweet about someone that features the bigger number, 
versus another one with a smaller number, you know this guy talked to an agent or got his info from the agent side. This guy got his info from the team side. So you can take this heuristic and apply it everywhere else because now you know the relationships, given the money has exposed it. But now when you hear stories broken about those individuals, you know it's probably coming from that source. Not guaranteed, but it's likely, a likely bonus, if you will. There are other ramifications here, right? I mean, it's not just the media game that's being played and how they get these numbers out there. Why he gets a scoop versus Shams gets a scoop or Chris Haynes gets a scoop or Mark Stein. Once you start seeing how this information is being delivered to the masses, you begin to understand how the sausage gets made. But Mm -hmm. also there's real basketball reasons why this Jordan Poole news is significant is that Jordan Poole got an extension and every dollar that is added to Jordan Poole's contract, whether it's 123 million versus 124 million, that's a big deal because every dollar that's being spent by the Warriors above the luxury tax line is going to hit a huge multiplier tax. And that money is being distributed to the rest of the league. Now, the way the CBA works is if I pay over the luxury tax line and Amin does not, Amin's team and Mays' team. I'm Oklahoma City and Mays is San Antonio. Mm. And we're both saying, Give me Wembenyama. Yeah, Wembenyama. And your Warriors money. That money is not going to be distributed to the teams that are already paying the tax. Those dollars are not sent to charity. It is given and distributed to non-tax paying teams. Now, it's important to note that it's not like if there was only one non-tax paying team, they would receive the entire kitty. The luxury tax bucket is divided into equal 30th shares. So the non-tax paying teams will each receive one thirtieth of the total tax revenue collected. The remaining shares for the however many taxpayers they are, guess who gets to keep that? The league. The NBA. Mm. NBA during Latino Heritage Month. So what does this do? Like, I mean, let's say you're the Miami Heat. Mm -hmm. And next year, you can be a tax-paying team. Mm -hmm. You see the Warriors over there have about $280 million of a tax bill Mm -hmm. because they're going to be about $50 million over the luxury tax line, which because of the repeater tax rules and because of the way the CBA is structured, that $50 million turns into almost $300 million. Mm. A third of a billion dollars is going to be distributed to the non-tax paying teams. If you're the Miami Heat, you're like, well, shit, I better get out of the luxury tax because I'm going to get a huge pot of gold from the Golden State Warriors. It's a double benefit. Benefit number one is you're not paying a tax. And the tax, as we said, is an escalator tax. Back in the day, it was a dollar for a dollar. I'm 50 million over the tax. I pay $50 million in tax. Now it's escalating. Well, it's a buck 50 for the first 5 million. And then the next 5 million after that, it's two, and then 250, et cetera, et cetera. So not only am I saving myself the tax money that I'm going to pay as a result of being over the tax, I am also getting a check in the mail. Hey, boss, remember this thing that's always going to cost 100 bucks? Well, now it's free. And also, I just got you another 20 bucks for free. I know you guys, oh, they're billionaires. I'm telling you right now, there's nothing they like more than saying, Merry Christmas. I got you something. Open up. And, oh, some money that I wasn't expecting. <laughs> yeah, that was one of my favorite things I saw over the weekend was that this is the light year strategy that Joe Lacob has put into place that by boosting his own tax bill through the roof, he is incentivizing other owners to stay under the tax and oh. potentially make their teams worse to not compete <laughs> because he's going to be paying for it. Light years, light years, baby. Hey, listener, guess what? You can spark something uncommon this holiday with just the right gift from our friends at Uncommon Goods. The busy holiday season is here, and Uncommon Goods makes it less stressful with incredible hand-picked gifts for everyone on your list. Yep, mom, dad, sister, brother, anybody. Weird uncle, doesn't matter. All in one spot, gifts that spark joy, wonder, delight, and that that's exactly what I wanted feeling. They scour the globe for original handmade Absolutely remarkable thing. Somehow, they know exactly the perfect gift for every single person you know. How crazy is that? Like a big jolly guy that just knows what to do. Here are a few of my favorite gifts that I found on their site. You know, I had to get me a California spoon rest. 
You can do like embroidered stuff. I'm going to do that for my parents or for their dogs, you know, some pet embroidered sweatshirts and t-shirts and stuff. And the piece de resistance for all of our fans who also love football, that football bingo set of two that we can all enjoy every Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Thursday, whenever they got football games for you. When you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. Many of their handcrafted products are made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give back $1 to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than $3 million to date. Let's get that number up by buying from Uncommon Goods. How do you do that, you ask? I'm so glad you posited that query. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash dings. That's uncommongoods.com slash dings, D-I-N-G-S, for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Hello, listener. It is your favorite Butcher Turn podcast producer, Maze, here to talk to you about ButcherBox. One of the biggest holidays on the butcher calendar is Thanksgiving. I can tell you from the front lines of slinging turkeys that it gets hectic at the grocery store during Thanksgiving. And that's why your search for the perfect Thanksgiving entree ends with ButcherBox. Take the stress out of holiday meal prep with your choice of humanely raised whole turkey, turkey breast, or ham free in your first order, plus get $20 off. When you go to butcherbox.com slash dings and enter code dings at checkout, sign up today and get ready for your easiest Thanksgiving yet delivered right to your door order by November 19th to guarantee delivery by Thanksgiving. Spend less time at the grocery store and more time enjoying the holidays with your family. Go to butcherbox.com slash dings and enter code dings D I N G S at checkout to get this offer plus $20 off your first box. I've got the list of teams that are tax-paying teams as of right now. Obviously, things can change. Do you guys want to play a little game of a means trivia? Can you guess how many we have? How many contestants we have here? I can think of three off the top of my head. I'm going to say six. Yeah. Ooh, sorry, boys. The answer is 10. Oh, wow. We've got 10 tax-paying teams. Okay. Do you want to wager a guess? Who is the number one tax-paying team? The Nets? I'll go with the Nets, the Brooklyn Nets. Sorry. The Nets come in third. Mm. $30.7 million over the luxury tax threshold. Definitely the Warriors are up there. It's got to be the Warriors. The Warriors are number two. $40.2 million above the tax threshold. I'm thinking, was that icon in the Microsoft Word? Was it Clippy? Clippy. I'm seeing visions of Clippy. I mean, am I right here? I wish I had my bell. Ding, 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 ding. That's right. Clippy and the Clippers, $41.7 million above the tax threshold. That is your biggest tax paying team in the NBA. Taking a look at their cap sheet, it's not hard to arrive at that place when you're paying Kawhi Leonard $42.5 million and you're paying Paul George $42.5 million. The rest of the sheet isn't crazy. It's just having two guys making $85 million will do that to you. So I guess the moral of the story here is the 76ers are just above that line. The Denver Nuggets are above that line. They could weasel their way out of that by sending some money, a deadweight contract over to a team that's under the cap and dump that money so that they can get some of that Clippers, Golden State Warriors luxury tax payments. And next year... There's, I think, four, maybe five teams. That could mean that real players to what Anthony was saying there earlier. Who's Anthony? We're going to downgrade our team. Yeah, did I call you Anthony? That's the first. Yeah, you did. It's the first in the history of basketball Illuminati. That's a great point because when you look at Denver at $10.5 million over the tax threshold, Dallas at 14.5, the Lakers at 16.8, Philly 6.1, and Phoenix at 16.2, it is not inconceivable that you can make a deal to get under the tax threshold. We've seen Miami do this many a time. Start the year as a taxpayer, and then right at the trade deadline, do some math to get under it. Particularly when you think to yourself, if you're the Lakers, it's very likely their season's not going to go the way they want it to. And by the time you reach the trade deadline, you might have an opportunity to say, well, can I shift some dead weight here? Can I get something for Patrick Beverly? It makes $13 million in the last year of his deal. 
in order to get under that tax threshold to get some breathing room. Yeah, they already have Dennis Schroeder. They already have another point guard, um, LeBron James. Yeah, yeah, him. Kendrick yeah. Nunn, who can also fill that position. So For every one of these situations where someone's trying to get under the tax, there's someone who's got cap space, who's willing to absorb for a little price, for a little taste, if you will. Yeah, Spurs, the Pacers, they're going to be waiting there. And I'm sure OKC will figure out a way to get under there as well. I mean, they got the Shea Gilgis Alexander contract, but one of the things that we kept to keep our eye open for is those deadline deals to get under the luxury tax because the Golden State Warriors have re upped Jordan Poole for 123 and possibly as high as 128, not the reported 140. And they weren't done extending people, Tom. They got Andrew Wiggins too. They did not do extensions for Clay Thompson and Draymond Green. Look, we know Draymond Green had the incident, the punching incident, the KD incident, the halftime incident, yelling at Steve Kerr where the cops had to come in and calm the situation down. There have been a bunch of those. And I think Bob Myers, the GM of the Golden State Warriors, said it, and I'm paraphrasing here, is he's in a great spot, Draymond. He's got a player option at the end of the year. He's going to make a lot of money. He's got a lot at stake, but you know, he's got a player option. He can make, you know, 20 plus million dollars next year if he wants. Can we talk about Wiggins for a second though? Cause he did take a $9 million discount from this year's salary to the next and a $22 million discount from the 10 year veteran max that he was eligible for. So he's sticking around. He's taking a pay cut. He's decreasing the tax bill. But even with all that, this is before Draymond's opt in for his 27.6 million dollar player option for next year. Bobby Marks is reporting that with only 12 players on the roster, the Warriors are looking at paying $483 million. Tack on Draymond's 27.6 plus the escalator tax for that. You're looking at way more than $500 million. Guys, Joe Lake bought this team for $450 million. So here's where it is fascinating, the financial dynamic at play. We are talking about all of the employees of the Warriors basketball players. We know their salaries, right? They're going to have a tax bill of north of $400 million next year. What about the business revenues that the Warriors are getting next year? What if the Chase Center is an absolute moneymaker to the point where they can get what, $800 million, $900 million in revenues? That's a steal. How much is Joe Lacob making on his arena that he built right there on the shore of San Francisco Bay? We had Brian Windhorst calling last season's championship a checkbook <laughs> win, a checkbook championship. If they win another one, what does that mean? It's beyond a checkbook. Give Joe Lacob credit. He built the arena, state of the art, charging a gazillion dollars to attend season ticket holders and just walk in price to watch the Warriors. And he's delivering. They win a championship. The team is coming back. I'm curious what you think about this, I mean, because Clay Thompson didn't come to an extension and neither did Draymond Green. And we do know that the NBA, the way this works, they're not paying you based on what you did. They're paying you based on what you will provide in this next contract. Right. But Clay Thompson, when he signed that max deal, after tearing his ACL, mm -hmm. they knew that he wasn't going to be playing for a year and they still gave him a max deal. So if I'm Clay Thompson, I'm like, Hey man, last deal, you were paying me based on what I have done. You gave me the max knowing that I was not going to play for at least a year pay up now. Come on. We did this last time. Do it for me and Draymond. And they didn't, they didn't come to an extension agreement even though they know they're coming in to pass their prime. So before they got their money, now they're giving it to younger players coming into their prime, Jordan Poole and Andrew Wiggins. That's well and nice, and thank you for your service and all that shit, but the important thing to realize is that we can't be in a situation where we're paying people past their prime years and years, particularly with the injury history that Clay Thompson has and with the general physical shape that Draymond Green is in. This isn't like an Adonis. This is a guy. What's the general shape of Draymond Green? Round. A pair. The cool thing for the Warriors is that luckily for them, these guys are under contract. It's not like I have to make a decision right away. In the case of Draymond Green, he's got this year and then a player option on the year after that. In the case of Clay, I think there's one more year on there. So they've got an opportunity in the case of Clay Thompson 
to really sit back and say, all right, let's see how he looks these next two years. Mm-hmm. With Draymond Green, it's a little bit shorter horizon. He can opt out at the end of this year, and when he does, you have to say, are we going to aggressively try to keep him, or are we going to allow him to find out what's out there and then either come back with his tail tucked between his legs or say thanks for the memories? And I think a lot of people, myself included, believe that Draymond Green is probably going to be gone after this year because I just can't see the Warriors committing the type of years and money that he's going to be looking for in free agency. Now, hmm, who's going to have cap space next year? Who's going to have like $47 million coming off their books this year Hmm. and might have some max room or big cap space there? Let's go to Trey Young here, tweeting October 7th, Draymond is trying to get to LA. Damn. That's when that video broke. And that was Trey Young's response. Hey, I could see it happening. That would be clutch. (laughs) Draymond Green goes over to the Lakers. Anthony Davis doesn't want to play the five, but you know who loves playing the five is Draymond Green. They can switch. They can basically ride off into the sunset with Bronny and the rest of them and live out their last years in LA. New media, you know? What's a better place to be than in L.A. for new media? But new media means you can do it from anywhere, so. Oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> you can do it from anywhere. But I think another place, they don't have cap space, but they can clear it in a hurry. The Portland Trailblazers. Keep your third eye on the Pacific Northwest as Damian Lillard is someone who best approaches the stylistics of one Steph Curry. And if you're Draymond Green and you want to show your former team, what they missed out on, what better way to do it than to take Damian Lillard and elevate his game much in the same way that he helped elevate Steph Curry's game. Or Detroit. Homecoming. Homecoming. It always works out. Look at the Lakers and Russell Westbrook. Homecoming. Always works out. (laughs) Joakim Noah in New York. Eddie Curry in Chicago. Dwayne Wade in Chicago. They always work out. These homecoming, end of your career, homecoming stories, Everyone is like LeBron James. I'm coming home and everyone has that swan song like LeBron James. It's just true. It's a fact. So book it. Draymond Green going to either the Pistons, the Blazers, or the Lakers, or anywhere else. You heard it here first on Basketball Illuminati. Everything's on the table here. But one thing that is going to be pulled from the table for a poor lawyer in New York City is those season tickets for the New York Knicks Mm. that he has held since the seventies. Well, breaking this past week is a news story that you won't believe. We're going to talk to Ian Begley of SNY longtime Knicks beat writer about one of the stories in the NBA that you might not have heard. But the reason why you listen to this podcast is we give you the stories you need to hear. Not what they want you to hear. My favorite part of this, Tom, is that, This whole legal embroglio started because the Knicks took away season tickets from people who are known resellers. And then this lawyer stepped in to represent these people. So they took his tickets. This has (laughs) all the ingredients of a classic succession freak out. Well, you, you think you can keep your tickets? Well, I'll take your tickets. I'll take everybody's tickets. And and everyone who works at your office, I'm going to take them tickets away. You want to take your kids to see a show? Not on my watch. You want to see Anna and Elsa and Ariel, Disney on Ice? Well, guess what? Off. Dolan Roy. You all think I'm licked. Well, I'm not licked. And I'm going to stay right here and fight for this lost cause. Even if this room gets filled with lies like these. And the tailors and all their armies come marching into this place. Somebody will listen to me. There's no better way to overpower a trickle of doubt than with a flood of naked truth. But the complexity and the gray lie not in the truth. But what you what do you with the truth once you have it. What is true and right is true and right for all. You and I both know that that's just not the truth. You can't handle the truth! It's too messy. Keeps him up nice. I'm here because in the end, the truth is worth the risk. Speak a little truth and people lose their minds. I'm a grown man. You can tell me the truth. Why is it people who want the truth never believe it when they hear it? So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something really outrageous. I'm going to tell the truth. 
Ian Begley is our truth teller today. I am so excited to have you on because this Nick story is about as bananas as it gets. This is an undisclosed location. It is a secure line. Mm-hmm. I want to thank you for doing intrepid reporting on this New York Knicks team that seems like it's from like a dystopian era, refusing to do media day, banning season ticket holders from the 70s, banning Charles Oakley. What else can this Knicks organization do to piss off its fans? Let's see what today brings. Let's see what tomorrow brings. But Tom, one of the interesting things to me is you mentioned pissing off the fans. I mean, maybe it's just the 10 loud Nick fans on Twitter. But, you know, when the Knicks announced that they weren't going to have media or they were doing an event with no media, a lot of the fans didn't care or were happy about it. And I was a little surprised at that reaction. But nonetheless, they certainly do not do things in an orthodox manner when it comes to media relations and when it comes to fan relations at MSG. Ian, I think the weird thing is they've got a terrible relationship with their former players, their former legends. They've got a terrible relationship with season ticket holders, right? In this case, there's a lawsuit going on between ticket resellers at Madison Square Garden. You might say, well, I mean, that sounds like something that might happen in a lot of different NBA cities, and you'd be right. The difference is the lawyer representing the ticket resellers happens to also be a Knicks season ticket holder, and Madison Square Garden Institute of Policy last June, within which they will suspend your season tickets if you are involved as the litigator in any sort of action against Madison Square Garden. In other words, this lawyer whose season ticket holding has nothing to do with the case that he's taken on as his job, has his season tickets suspended or revoked temporarily while he's involved in this case. And not only that, 59 other lawyers at his law firm are getting collateral damage here. The whole firm, because he is representing these 24 ticket resellers, um, everyone at the firm is no longer allowed to go to MSG, or any of the surrounding MSG-owned venues, including Beacon Theater, the Chicago Theater. Radio City Music Hall. As the New York Times details, that can cover Disney on Ice to Harry Styles concerts to Knicks and Rangers games. All right, you might have beef with this one guy who's agreeing to represent these ticket resellers that are trying to sue MSG. But to do it for all of the MSG venues, for all of the employees... That's just astounding, Ian. To me, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know the legal motivation for the garden or what it really means for the suit. But when the lawyer who had his tickets revoked says that it's such a minute possibility for me or anyone at my firm to have contact with an MSG employee at the arenas in a way that could impact the lawsuit, he said, you know, there's very little chance of it happening. To me, like, it's a petty thing and it's sending a message to season ticket holders or ticket holders, hey, if you want to come to our arenas and you're a lawyer, don't get involved in a lawsuit with us. The only reason I am a little hesitant to analyze this one in particular is because I don't know the legalese involved. I don't yes. know like, hey, is it putting a lawsuit in danger if you're having people in your building talking to your employees? I don't know. My point is it's yet another, first of all, they enacted this thing in June. When did the garden open? 1969 or whatever? It wasn't a problem for the first 50 plus years of Madison Square Garden. Now it's an issue. It's just another brick in the wall between them and the rest of the world. We talked about 29 NBA teams had media day the day before the first day of camp. Not the Knicks. They had content day. It seems to me like an insane level of pettiness where you're just playing isolationist. At what point in... Do you feel like the league starts to get involved? All right, this is insane now. You guys are acting completely irrationally. My guess is from a league perspective, it's more so incident by incident based. And I think that, I mean, I know that after the Charles Oakley incident and the aftermath of that, in which Jim Dolan, the Nick owner, came out and uh, accused Charles Oakley of being an alcoholic, it was a huge mess. I know people from the league were upset about how that played out and were upset with the Knicks and, and Jim Dolan with how it played out. In this one, I don't know if the league has a thought or an opinion, but you guys know how this works, right? I don't think anything would be acted upon from a league perspective unless it threatens the bottom line of 
the team or the league. I mean, we've seen it time and time again. We saw it with Robert Sarver. We saw it with Donald Sterling. It was the sponsorships being impacted, business relationships being impacted by the behavior of an owner. And that caused the league to take actions. I think in general, there's going to be no action taken unless and until the bottom line starts taking a hit. Ian, you're one of the best beat writers in the NBA. You cover the Knicks for SNY for quite a long time. You were a colleague of ours at ESPN and you've been around the league for how long now? Like how long have you been covering the league? Jeez, I want to say going on 13 years. Okay. You've been in a lot of arenas. You've been in a lot of press rooms. You've been in a lot of scrums at practice and shoot around. Can you give the people who are listening a little glimpse at to what it's like covering the Knicks versus say covering the Warriors or covering a Pistons practice? Like in what ways are the Knicks different on the beat than other beats? I mean, I can certainly talk about it and I will, but I want to say here's where my perspective I think is limited because I know covering the Knicks day in and day out. And I don't know covering the Warriors day in and day out what that's like. I can't give you my firsthand perspective on it. But I will say that in general, pro sports, if you have a story you want to tell and you ask to speak to a player or a coach involved in that story, usually a team will work with you to get you that player. You can talk to the player. You can talk to the coach. You can talk to the team official to help get more perspective, to round out the story. With the Knicks, you're not getting one-on-ones. You're getting the NBA-mandated access. And so that means you're getting players, coaches on game days and practices based on whatever the league has determined to be the blanket protocol for teams. The baseline, bare minimum, right. Yeah. So other teams are making their executives available you know, over the course of the season, at least twice, really, you're going to get the executive preseason before the season starts. You're going to get the executive after the season, maybe at the trade deadline. I mean, that's happening pretty much across the league. I don't want to overstate it. I haven't tallied up what they've done, but just generally speaking, that's accepted practice. You're not getting that with the Knicks. Leon Rose, he spoke to the media on a Zoom call when Tom Thibodeau was introduced as head coach. He spoke to the media before last season with Scott Perry and Tom Thibodeau. And we haven't heard from him since. We've heard from him only in two interviews with MSG Network. Now listen, I try not to take these things personally. If Leon Rose doesn't want to talk to the media, that's fine. But don't talk to MSG Network, the home of the New York Knicks. Don't grant interviews there and then not talk to anybody else. I just think that's misplaying your hands from a media relations perspective. But we know that Jim Dolan doesn't want his executives available beyond the VA mandate access. And so Leon Rose, if he doesn't want to talk to the media, he's not going to hear from his boss, hey, you need to go talk to the press. Jim Dolan, I I would assume, has no problem with Leon Rose not talking. So I think it starts at the top there when you're looking at big picture, how the media and the Knicks interact. I think that's an interesting question is how much of this is Dolan edict? How much of it is... Dolan culture created that now people below him say, well, this fits in line with our ethos as a company. Meaning not a specific, hey, Leon, don't talk to the media, but Leon understanding, well, we are not a media-friendly organization, so now I don't have to do this because my boss doesn't care. Yeah, well, the one thing, I mean, there I would say is I think Steve Mills and Scott Perry, you know, after Phil Jackson parted ways, was fired, decided to leave, whatever happened, Steve Mills took over, hired Scott Perry as his general manager. The thinking then, and I assume that it was greenlit by Jim Dolan, the thinking then was, hey, we're going to be more accessible. We're going to try to be more transparent. We're going to try to speak to the media and get our message out to the fans more often than we have in the past. And I think several things happened over the course of Mills and Perry's tenure to change that approach. But I think that approach, my understanding at least, was the approach was changed knowing that it's either what Jim Dolan had wanted or what he would want. And so the water was cut off at a certain point. And it's been kind of where we are now since then. 
but there was an effort and there was at least an understanding that executives would be a little bit more available going back a few years when Steve Mills and Scott Perry had taken over. So I want to quote here from Larry Hutcher, the lawyer that has had season tickets since the 70s and has all sorts of Nick's memorabilia in his office. And there's a big New York Times story about it in the lawsuit about the legal jeopardy about attending these games. He says, how many MSG employees fall into this limited category? The odds of an individual plaintiff discussing the subject of the litigation with that MSG employee are astronomical. And he finishes with this line. There are better odds of being struck by lightning or the Knicks winning the NBA championship this year. Just gold. Pretty good shot. Pretty good shot. This is a lawyer who realizes he's not getting those season tickets. Like after putting that in the lawsuit, it's over. There's no way he's going to be able to attend a game because we do know that what 2018, the New York Times reported that MSG was using some surveillance technology where they can do face recognition. Facial recognition. Yep. Theoretically, you would say, oh, it's for people who have been banned from going to the garden because they got into a fight or got too drunk or whatever. But they were using it to identify fans who had been critical of either the team or Jim Dolan on social media. That's bananas. It's one thing when you're an independent business, you run your business how you want to run it, right? And typically the dollars will tell you whether you're running your business well or not well. But when you're part of a bigger conglomerate, I just feel like the league should be more concerned about this. I'm not saying about, you got to make them sell the team. I'm not, I'm not going that far. I'm just saying there have to be standards and practices that we adopt as a league. There's a reason why you can't just do whatever you want for halftime because there's a standard set by the league. Like so halftime has to be this long. You can't go any longer than this. It's the same reason why you can't fly in on the day of a game unless it's extenuating circumstances like, you know, a snowstorm or whatever. It's not up to you. It's not like, oh, I got to do whatever I want. So it's just insane to me that these things are happening. And it's just like, well, that's just the Knicks. That's how they want to do it. I had no idea. I mean, this must have happened. The Times must have reported that when my second kid was born or around that time. Because the idea that they had been looking for people who were critical of the team on social media, I didn't know that. That's wild to me. So when you talk about the Charles Oakley incident and you talk about hiring and firing of executives, this franchise for two decades, to me, the impact there, yes, it makes the franchise look bad. It makes Jim Dolan look bad and opens everybody up for criticism. But the bottom line is, is it helping the Knicks win or is it hurting the Knicks' chances of winning? And I think that there are players who have known about all this stuff that we talk about, particularly Oakley. I don't want to put it all under one big blanket because I don't think that is a fair analysis, but the Oakley thing hurt the Knicks with free agents. I've heard that and I believe that. And so I think when you look at all these things, if you're a fan, you should be thinking, is this helping us or hurting us if I want to see this team win? And several of these instances have certainly hurt the club. The lawyer incident, I don't know if a player is going to see that and have an opinion one way or the other. I'll say again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know what is at stake if these lawyers attend these events in these different venues. I don't know if the lawyer incident would would hurt the Knicks from a win-loss perspective, but there have been incidences, including the Oakley thing and Jim Dolan taking on fans, I think, that have impacted their chances of landing free agents. Yeah, I guess my point overarching is like, yeah, this story is on its face, just kind of unbelievable that MSG that is sitting in the biggest city in America, arguably the biggest brand recognition with the New York Knicks, aside from like the Lakers, right? That you would be able to pull this thing off and have anything come from the league. They can get away with this. Why should James Dolan care? People are going to come to Knicks games and people are going to go cheer on the Knicks, regardless if they kick out Charles Oakley, the players are going to come through. They got Jalen Brunson in the off season. So what? I guess I'm playing devil's advocate here. It's like, so what? Do fans really care about a lawyer? The New York Knicks, their stance has been, yeah, you're still going to go to Knicks games. You're going to still chant, go New York, go New York, go. And until that's proven otherwise, what's the recourse? Besides the league stepping in, which I don't think would happen unless there's financial ramifications to something, to an event. Yeah, I think that's the bottom line. People are going to still come to these games. And this is kind of getting into the weeds a little bit, but I remember there was a protest outside of Madison Square Garden. It had been publicized for a couple of weeks. Didn't end up being a huge protest, but there were people who showed up demanding that Jim Dolan sell the team. And then a few weeks later, 
Phil Jackson was hired as team president. I don't know if you make a connection between those two events. You might, you might not. But I think that Jim Dolan does respond or hears the criticisms of himself when it comes to fans suggesting that he sells a team. That is something that he has responded to in the past. But with regard to overarching, like the Knicks changing their approach, I can't see it happening. You know, unless people stop coming to games for whatever reason, I don't see that happening. Or unless the league were to step in, and I, I can't see that happening either. Ian, thank you for joining Illuminati this week. We'll have you on again in the future when the Knicks win the championship and that lawyer's prophecy is actually incorrect. Or when you get struck by lightning, Ian. <laughs> I'm looking forward to checking in with, with you guys after the last. <laughs> such a great line here. Even though he faithfully renewed this subscription to his great expense through zero championships, long playoff droughts, postseason failures, and coaching musical chairs, he was still summarily discarded by MSG without warning solely because he fulfilled his ethical duties to his clients. The suit reads. The New York Knicks run New York City! <laughs> Bing bong! Tell me a little something, KD. Don't you regret not coming to the Knicks?